This kind of be going to be an overview on uh, muzzle loading. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail, but uh, there's a lot of sayings that came from uh, from weapons. Uh, back in the revolutionary days, you say you, you like if you bought something, you bought it lock, stock, and barrel. That's to do with the gun. You bought the lock, which is the mechanism, the stock, and the barrel. It's the whole thing. You bought the whole package. Also, uh, during the war, you've heard everybody's heard the story. Uh, you know, I gave it the whole nine yards. Anybody know what that came, where that came from? You do. It's all on the length of the. Uh, right. That's the length of the uh, belt of ammunition in World War II fighter planes, 27 feet. So if when they came, when the fighter planes came up there and they found a, uh, a German or a Jap aircraft and they fired the whole, they emptied the guns, they gave it the whole nine yards. And then another one flashed in the pan. That's from a musk or from a uh, flintlock. It flashes, but the gun doesn't go off. It just it's a uh, it looks good, but it doesn't work out. Kind of like Ryan Leaf and the Chargers, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> definition of a muzzle loader. Pretty simple. It's a weapon that's loaded from the front, from the muzzle. That's why they call them front stuffers, muzzle loaders. They use black powder or a black powder substitute. Um, some of the newer muzzle loaders actually use regular standard rifle powder, smokeless powder, but. Um, I'm not going to be talking about that too much. Uh, they fire a single projectile. Now the projectiles, um, I've got some examples of, uh, here and I'll go over those in just a second. But as I said, the muzzle loader is comprised of three parts. The lock, which is the firing mechanism, the stock and the barrel. I've got some pictures here of various types of uh, muzzle loaders. This is a pistol. This is a flintlock. The flintlock, I'm going to pass these around too. It's got a hammer. The hammer you cock back and holds a flint. When you pull the trigger, the flint goes down and hits a, 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 a bar that's got grooves across it. It's called a frizzin. The frizzin covers up what's called a pan. That holds your priming powder. So when the uh, when the when you pull the trigger, the flint goes forward, hits this groove plate, causes sparks. The sparks go down into the pan, which sets off the priming powder, goes through a little hole into your firing charge. The gun goes off. There is a delay on uh, on those. To improve on the uh, flint locks. They came up with the idea of a percussion rifle. It's basically a uh, like a cap rifle. They have a little cap that goes over a nipple. The hammer is cocked. The hammer comes down, hits the nipple. The nipple fires into the uh, the pipe and goes into the uh, powder firing chart. It's a much more efficient and uh, secure type of a uh, uh, system it works a lot better you get a lot of flash in the pans with the with the uh, flint locks the the uh, primers the uh, percussions pretty much go off all the time there's three kinds of uh, pretty much three kinds of muzzle loaders that uh, they have nowadays they've got the old uh, the the real original uh, flint locks and percussions that people have. Then they've got the modern replicas. Uh, this particular one is one of mine. This is a Thompson Center Hawken. This is a replica, modern replica of a, of a Hawken. This is a 45 caliber. It's got the set triggers. This is a side lock percussion. They also make this in flint lock. This is another uh, modern uh, percussion side lock. This is another one of mine. 
This is a Thompson Center. It's a Greyhawk. This is a 54 caliber side lock percussion. This particular one has a slightly different ignition system in that it uses mu uh, musket caps, which I'm going to get to in just a second. I'll show you the difference. It's a little hotter uh, fire, a little bit more powerful. This is my Thompson Center Omega. This is one of the new modern uh, black powder uh, muzzle loaders. This it utilizes a 209 ignition system, which is a shotgun primer. They typically have a falling block where you shove the uh, primer in, or they tip up and you shove the primer in. They're still a muzzle loader, but they're in line. And the reason they're called an in line is because the, the primer is right behind the firing charge, and when you fire it, the charge goes directly into the uh, ignition charge. There's none of this bending around following a, uh, a hole to set it off. Very, uh, very powerful guns. Now, everybody talks about the, uh, the accuracy of muzzle loaders. Um, the old, uh, the old mu muzzle loaders were originally started out with a, like a musket, or a, uh, no rifling at all. Then they came up and they, they got a rifled musket or a rifle where they started putting rifling in them. Typically, they were shooting a round ball. Round ball, just a round lead ball with a patch. You put the, you pour the powder down the down the barrel, put this patch on the end of the barrel, put the ball on there, and then you use what's called a short start or short starter. It's a deal like this, because you can't shove that ball down the, uh, down the barrel. It's got a little indentation here where you put this on there and just get it started. Then you take this, smack it down the barrel about that far, and then you pick up your ramrod and shove it down the barrel the rest of the way onto the powder charge. Now, black powder is not weighed. It is measured. <coughs> This is a powder measure that I use. You just pull the, pull the back out. It's got graduations on it that you set it to whatever charge you want. Uh, typically around 100 grains of powder. Lock it in place. Take your powder, fill this up. Close the, close the top. Dump it down the barrel, followed by your projectile. Now, um, as I said, the, uh, the original round ball shooters, I know Dave's got one, uh, a CVA kit, pretty accurate. They've taken a lot of game with just, just the round ball, so they're pretty, they're pretty deadly but they're originally about 1 in 60 or 1 in 66 twist. Then they started shortening them up when they came up with a better uh, ball during the Revolutionary War called a mini ball. We use those today. And now we even use uh, pistol bullets, rifle bullets in a plastic sleeve called a, it's actually called a sabot, but everybody calls them sabots. This, a sabot is just a plastic sleeve that the bullet fits in. Pass those around. This is a card that I'm going to pass around. The top here is a round ball. The second is one of my hunting rounds, which is a 245 grain, 45 caliber Barnes all copper bullet, hollow point, that fits in a plastic sleeve or a sabot. The third one down here is a uh, modern mini ball, which was originally designed uh, 
for the rifled muskets or rifles during the Revolutionary War. And the bottom one is a 250 grain Hornady 45 caliber pistol bullet that you can also put in a uh, savet and used in your rifles. Now, a 50 caliber rifle uses a, typically uses a 45 caliber bullet. The only 50 caliber bullet here is the mini ball. You want to pass that around? You can see that. As I mentioned earlier, there are several types of ignition. You've got the flintlock. I don't own one, so I, and I can't bring it in here anyway, but that picture pretty much described it. There are three types of ignition, primer ignition for a, for a muzzle loader. There's what you, the original one was called a number 11 cap. That's a small one that fits over the nipple and fires. They're, they're pretty reliable. My 54 uses a musket cap. It almost looks, it's the top one here. It looks like a top hat. It's about a triple charge, a lot hotter, and very definitely a better ignition system. And the bottom one is the 209 shotgun primer that's used for the inline rifles. Now, as I said, we use uh, black powder and black powder substitute. I don't use black powder per se anymore. So I don't have any with me, but it's it's your Goex, your uh, uh, black powder. It's black powder. It's been around for years. It's very smelly. It's very messy. It works fine. But these are modern uh, black powder substitutes. This is Pirate X RS, which stands for rifle shotgun. This is a uh, uh, this is Pirate X Select which is just a more refined version of this. It's a more uniform uh, granulation, and it's typically more accurate. This is 777. This is a little different. This is hotter. It's a cellulose-based uh, black powder substitute, and uh, it's uh, typically a lot hotter, faster, than the, uh, than the other two. The only trouble is it leaves what they call a crud ring. When you, uh, when you fire it off, it, it leaves a ring uh, down at the firing chamber of your, uh, of your rifle. And uh, it gets kind of crunchy. It's like granulated sugar. And after a while, it, it's difficult to ram a second or third round in there after a couple of shots. So after, especially using 777, uh, after you shoot these a couple times, you have to do uh, a spit swap. You take um, just a, a, a clean patch, put it in your mouth, or dump water on it, put it on your rifle, swab it through, clean out your rifle, then run a dry patch through it, and then you're ready to go again. The latest powder is Blackhorn 209. This is a dream powder. Uh, it does not, uh, it, it doesn't absorb moisture like the others do. After you have these around for a while, they absorb moisture and they, they lose some of their potency. This does not seem to uh, absorb as much moisture or, or any, any moisture at all. Uh, you use less of it. It's more expensive, but it is hotter. Uh, and it does not crud your barrel up. I have taken my rifles out to the range and fired 20, 30, 40 rounds all day and never spit swabbed the barrel at all, never had to clean it. You just shoot it, pour, some, pour the next round, shove it down. The first, the 20th round goes through into your, down your barrel just as easy as the first one does. Now the granulations that are used in black powder, uh, there's typically three granulations. They use an F designation, and all that is the, is the size of the screen that the, that the powder is extruded through. Um, double F powder, FFG, is the, is the designation that you'll see. 
Double left powder is used typically on 45 caliber and above. Triple left powder, which is a little finer, is used on 45 caliber and smaller. And then the 4F granulation is a very fine powder that's used in the pan of a flintlock to prime the flintlock. You got bigger powder that they use for cannons and stuff like that, but I'm not talking about those. They also have, they've come up in the last few years with pellets, which are, uh, they look like uh, wafers of compressed black powder, and uh, they have, it's a different color because they got black powder, it's actually rocket fuel, but there's black powder on one side and the propellant or rocket fuel is on the other side and it's got to be loaded into your rifle with the black powder down. If you don't, you're going to get a misfire. Uh, they're also subject to, if, if you ram the barrel, or ram the rod down too hard, you're going to crush the pellet and that can cause some problems. They're quicker, but uh, as I said, all, uh, all powders are measured by volume. One pound of powder contains 7,000 grains of, uh, of powder. So one pound equals 7,000 grains. Typical hunting load is approximately 100 grains of powder. So you're going to get about 70 shots out of one can of powder. My hunting load's 90, 90 grains, so I'm going to get a little bit more. How many do you, what's your hunt? 90? 30 out of 33. Okay. Let's see. I went over the primers and the percussion caps. Um, now, the, all of those rifles that I have just happen to be Thompson Centers. I got my first Thompson Center as a thank you for a RV trip that I did uh, for, a, for a gal. We were, we were in the base camp, and she bought me the, she saw it uh, in a sporting goods store in Colorado, and I fell in love with it, but the wife said, no, you can't have it. Well, the gal that was on the trip that we were shepherding in, on this bike race bought it for me as a thank you. That was the 54 caliber uh, Thompson Center Greyhawk, and I figured that's going to be my elk rifle. The uh, second one that I got was the 45 caliber Hawken replica, and I bought that from a friend, from a guy that um, his, whose brother died down the down the street, uh, and I got it got it from him. The uh, Omega, the inline, was a uh, the, uh, a rifle that I asked for. My kids gave it to me for my 70th birthday, and. Uh, that's my that's my hunting rifle. That's the one. I think most of you have seen it with me with the pig on the uh, on the website. That's the one that took the pig at uh, 59 yards, right through double lung. He just gave him a real quick dirt nap on that one. That was with the Omega. Okay, the sabots. These sabots are manufactured uh, of a plastic composite. Uh, most of them are made by a company called MMP, which stands for Mus Muzzle Load Magnum Products in Arkansas. They make the best ones. They make probably 99% of the sabots on the market are made by MMP. They come in every size, every diameter you can think of. The ones that you buy, depending on the length of the bullet, the diameter of the bullet, the size of the bullet, and the tightness of your barrel. Um, there is no standard diameter uh, for a rifle. Uh, a 50 caliber can be anything. Thompson Centers are notorious for tight barrels, thin. Other CVAs are bigger. So you basically have to try the different sabots and the different bullets to find out which one goes down your your barrel the best. You want you don't want to have to beat one down the barrel. 
because that will deform everything and it's just too difficult. Yet you don't want one that just fit, that just drops down. You want it to have some force, but the, something that you can shove down the barrel. And once you find that, uh, you just pattern them and, uh, and try them out. For example, the, the 50 caliber for the Thompson centers that I use, they have the uh, three pedal easy, that's the name of the, of the Sabin, a three pedal easy, which is the, the smallest. Then you have the HPH 24, and, which is the middle, and the HPH 12, which is bigger. So depending on the barrel, if you've got a very tight barrel, you'd use the three pedal easy, which is the smallest, middle size barrel, the 24, and if you've got a very large barrel, you'd use the 12. You just, all I'm saying, don't, don't get confused by the numbers and stuff and the, the nomenclature. You just have to try various savants to find which one fits your barrel. Okay, the loading process on a muzzle loader. As I said, the powder is measured by volume, not by weight, so you don't have to carry a scale with you out there on the, uh, uh, in the field. The first thing you do is find, <laughs> you take your uh, powder measure, measure your powder, dump it down the barrel. The second thing you do is put your patch on the end of the barrel, followed by the ball or your, or your bullet, whatever you're shooting. Then you take your short starter, hit it, shove it down this far, then you use your ramrod. Now, in the field, all the muzzle loaders, you see them on the movies, they all have this rod underneath the barrel. It doesn't have this on it. Now, I don't know why, this is a, the, uh, all of the rods that you see on these muzzle loaders are full length all the way out to the end of the barrel. And that's what they look like. They're just hanging under the barrel. So after you shoot, if you're gonna if you're gonna reload, you gotta load the powder, put the stuff in there, shove the patch, shove the bullet in there. Then you gotta take a ramrod and ram it down the, the rest of the way. So you're gonna take this thing out, then you gotta sit there and screw this thing in here, like this. This is called a jag. Then you take it and you shove this, start shoving it down in stutter steps. If you start from the top, you're going to bend your barrel. So you start down here, just shove it a little bit, move up, shove it down, and then ram it all the way. You notice this is a little small. So most people use some sort of a palm saver. This is just a doorknob with a screw on it. But they have, you have um, other ones that just cup over there and ram this thing down all the way. Yes, sir? Is it bend your barrel or bend your right. back? I'm sorry? You said if you do a full length, yeah. you'll bend your barrel? No, you'll bend the rod. Okay. So, this rod, this is the one I use in the field for a second shot. But I, I had this rod, this ram rod specially made, I cut it an inch short so that I could leave this thing on the whole time. So it's a lot quicker, saves a lot of time. Because reloading a muzzle loader is a little diff difficult. Now if you're going to load a, um, a sabotage bullet, you just put the, you just put the uh, powder down there and then you grab the, the sabot and the bullet together, put it on there, just put your ramrod on there and start shoving it down there. That's all there is to it. There's nothing, no, no patches at all. This, the sabot is the patch. Now, if you need to make a second shot with a muzzle loader, they have what they call, it's a misnomer, speed loaders. Because there's no such thing as loading a muzzle loader fast. You can, it takes probably close to, well, you can do it under a minute with one of these. This is a speed loader. This bottom portion pulls out like that. The sabotage bullet is put in, nose up, butt down. This is filled up with powder and closed. 
Your primer cap, if you're using a number 11, goes in here. If you're using a, uh, a 209, which I do, goes right in here. So this whole thing with the bullet, the powder, and the primer goes in your pocket. So you shoot, tip your gun up, pops the cap, dump the powder in, take this, you just set it on the end of the barrel and hit the end. This just pushes it right out and shoves it down the barrel. Take your rod, and there's your primer. Put it in there and you're ready to go. You can you can load reload a muzzle loader with one of these in what 30 to 45 seconds probably, something like that. Now, laws. The the laws vary from state to state, obviously. California is uh, one, it's liberal in some senses and very strict in others. First of all, they say a muzzle loader has to be a primitive weapon. You have to use primitive sights. No scopes. That picture I sent around with my Omega has a scope on it. I can't use that during muzzle loader season. I can use it during the general rifle season, but not during muzzle loader season. I would have to use one of the other two. They have regular sights or in the case of those guns, they've got peep sights on them. Those are legal. Some states have bullet laws. It depends on the, uh, you've got to use a certain diameter and a certain length compared to the diameter, and they go all different ways. And uh, you were telling me uh, what, early, there's a state, Florida, or something? Well, Pennsylvania, I believe, still only allows OK, he said possibly. Pennsylvania only uses flintlocks. I don't know, but you got to check your state laws. But the one thing, the biggest thing about muzzle loaders, it extends your season. You get an extra season. It's like archery season, then deer, then rifle season. You get a special muzzle loader season, and you can use the muzzle loader during general rifle season uh, if you want to. I don't own a deer rifle. I got three black powder muzzle loaders, and that's what I use. We went deer hunting last week. I had my Omega but it's during general season, so I can use it. Uh, as far as cost to uh, shoot, uh, 100 grain load, as I said, you get about 70 per can. Uh, you 50 to 100 uh, grains, depending on the uh, powder or projectile. 15 cents to 75 cents per shot, depending on the amount of powder you want to sho shove in there. The round balls, uh, they're about, uh, $13 a hundred, 13 cents a shot. Conicals are about 75 cents a piece. Sabotage pistol bullets, 58 cents. The sabotage rifle bullets, these things right here, 24 bullets. Uh, I tore the price tag off. Seems to me it was about 25 bucks. So they're, they're upwards, of, uh, upwards of a dollar a shot. That's just for the bullet. Uh, primers are nothing, they're four cents. Anyway, people are talking about muzzle loaders. They, they don't think that uh, they're very accurate. Some of these modern muzzle loaders are good out to 500 yards and beyond. My little Omega that I got, I. When I started shooting, I went through all of these powders. I finally settled on the Blackhorn and this uh, Barnes. This is a 245 grain boat tail hollow point. There's the pattern. Three shots touching at 100 yards. That's better than some standard rifles. Um, the equipment that you're going to need, if you get a, uh, a muzzle loader rifle, first of all, you need the rifle. You can use this ramrod that comes with it, but most people use what they call a range rod. 
This is a brass or bronze rod that I made up very sturdy and really works well. Uh, you can even take it with you out on the hunt if you want to lug it around for a second shot. But if you're going to take a second shot, you know, the animal's going to be gone, so you can take your time and reload, and you can use this, this particular rod for a second shot. But you're going to want a range rod. Very easy to make up. They, buy, they also sell them. Uh, as far as tools go, you're going to need a, what they call a jag. A jag is a uh, the device that fits on the end of your rod that fits whatever bullet you're using. This particular one is for a round ball. This particular one fits this bullet. I've got another bullet over here. This is the one I got the pig with. This is a, uh, it's a blunter, uh, much more blunt bullet with a much wider uh, hollow point. This jag will not fit this bullet. You've got to get a special jag for this bullet. Another thing that you'll need is your short start, speed loaders, an empty pill bottle to throw in some black powder just in case you run out of your, you got, I carry two of these. If you go through those, this is just extra powder in case you need it. You need a couple little devices to carry some extra primers. They just fit right in there, you can pop them right out. Just spare stuff. Now if you happen to load, let's just say you forget to put the powder in the barrel and you ram a uh, patch and a ball down the barrel, obviously with no powder, you're kind of screwed. It's not going to go anywhere. So the old bullet extractor, this screws on the end of your ramrod. I don't know what you can't see it, but it's a, it's a, a round guide and it looks like a, a wood screw. You ram that down the barrel and start twisting your ramrod and this screws right into the soft lead and you pull the, bu pull the bullet right out. So that takes care of your bullet. Now you've got a patch down there. Corkscrew type thing on the end of your of a device. Put that onto your barrel, on your uh, rod. Put that down the barrel, start twisting it. That'll pick up your patch, pull it right out. Fixes it. If you really get into trouble, this is a breech plug. Now this is for the uh, for the Omega, and you you can unscrew the breech plug on the Omega, and that way you can just knock the bullet right out from the other end. It opens up the back, and it just goes right through. But that's not about all you need, and then like. This is just, this is spare bullets. This little device I made, it just holds extra bullets. So uh, in case I use those two. Yes, sir? A question, yeah. if that black horn, is that a non-corrosive powder? And the other question is, if you had to pick a caliber as being the most accurate, which one would you pick? Okay, the black horn is not non-corrosive. There's no black powder substitute that is non-corrosive. But it is the most non-corrosive powder on the market today. So what's the longest you would go after going to the range and cleaning your rifle? Do you always clean it that day, that night? I do, within the next day or two, depending on what I'm doing. But, you know, you could leave it a week or two, and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. It would clean up. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that with the others, or especially with black powder. And black powder, that gets to be a mess because the way they uh, the way they cleaned it, the way they originally cleaned the black powder, was to unscrew the the nipple, put a put a cleaning rod with a with a cleaning patch in one end, stick the stick the back end of the barrel in a bucket of very very hot water, and suck the hot water in and out of the barrel and clean it out. 
very, very messy, and uh, it, it's a pain in the butt. What caliber would you say is the most uh, accurate? Well, I don't know that there's any one. I think I think any one can be just as accurate as as the rest. Most of the modern rifles that are coming out now are 50 caliber. You can you can get them. Uh, up to 54 and 58, or probably even bigger than that. And you can get some smaller, like 45 and even 38. But most of the rifles that are made today, you'll find will be 50 caliber. Now, unless you're shooting a conical, the full-size lead bullet, that's a 50 caliber. The others that you'll be shooting will be about 45. The, the, the round ball will be 40 like for 49, because the patch takes up the rest. What about these pellet charges that you shoot? You throw the pellet down there, and then you throw your patch and your ball down? Okay, the pellet charges are made in 30, 50, and 60 grain loads. It, they look like little wafers with a hole through the middle. They have a black powder charge on one side, and a, it's actually rocket fuel on the other. That's the one. And you you put you mix and match the configure the pellets to whatever load you want. So if you want a 150 grain load, which is typically the maximum load for most modern muzzle loaders, you'd use three 50 grain pellets. If you want to use 100, you'd use two. If you want 120, uh, what you, 260s. Now, the only problem with that is when you put them down there, if you use too much pressure to rent to seat that bullet, you can crush those pellets. And once they break apart, uh, you're going to get wildly erratic uh, pressures and shooting. They're not consistent. The most consistent powder that you can use is loose granular powder, black powder, or black powder substitutes. Uh, but the, the, there's two reasons I would throw at you to consider muzzle loading. First of all, it's a ball. You get out there with a smoke pole and start shooting, and you're going to have a lot of volunteers that want to take a shot with that. They just love it, love to see that smoke. You know, bam! Look around, and they run around the side, look around that cloud of white smoke to see if they hit the target. And uh, they're just fun to shoot. But secondly, they really expand your hunting season. They give you a whole nother season to go hunting. And they are deadly. So, any, I think that about covers it. Any questions? Yes, sir. You go hunting and don't take a shot, you try to load in your gun, obviously you take primer cap off, but you do. what do you do at that point? Okay, good question. First of all, um, when you're transporting a uh, black powder rifle, a black powder rifle is not considered loaded in California with a, with a, a load with powder in the barrel followed by a bullet, completely loaded, as long as it is not primed. If you, don't have, if you don't have a cap on the nipple or a 209 primer in the, in the breech, the gun is unloaded. Now, the question was, how long can you leave it there? The best thought is at the end of the day, you shoot it, you just fire it, blow it out. In the morning, put a fresh load in. Now, it depends on the humidity. Not so much with the blackhorns because they, it, it does not absorb moisture like the old black powder or black powder substitutes do. So it's not so important. I've gone two and three days with the blackhorn 209 where I don't have great huge temperature changes. And also, oh another thing, <laughs> these are little finger protectors that you buy at the drugstore. That's what they are. They're finger protectors. You have them? I have them in my... This is, 
wallet. Yeah. <laughs> I have my wallet. This is called a possibles bag, and I have no idea why it's called a possibles bag other than it holds everything that you could possibly want when you're when you're out there hunting. This is all you have. You got this and your rifle, and you're good for the day. But anyway, we put that over the end of the barrel. It keeps out any moisture, uh, anything like that. Uh, they used to use during the Revolutionary War, they had a, a, a wooden stick with a cap on the end of it that when they're marching with the rifles up, they could put that stick in the cap over the barrel and that would keep the rain out. But this little finger uh, protector is uh, a lot better. And it's the right size, nice and, nice and small. <laughs> but you know why to shoot the rifle with the stick. Yeah! <laughs> no, you gotta dump the stick out. This, this thing you can shoot right you know, right over it. I had to unload my uh, Omega uh, last uh, last week. We were, Rob and Richard and I were up uh, deer hunting, and uh, so at the end of the day, uh, I just I fired it. We picked out a uh, stick at about oh, it was not quite a hundred yards, and uh, I had that rubber tube cone right over the thing. Fired right through it, hit the, hit the stick, no problem. It won't, it won't affect the uh, accuracy of the bullet at all. You can also use black tape over the end of the barrel, but that's easier. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, your first ride was right. the Yes. Is she married? Pardon me. Is she married? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, this is a little safety tip for people who have the older percussion side of the side lock. Is that back in the Civil War, it came up with this because they would uh, sometimes ram two or three balls down there in the height of the uh, battle, you know, and get excited. And what they would do is they would get a regular charge and they would establish their charge with the ball on top, ram it down all the way, and then Mark off right at the at the uh, edge of the barrel. Go to mark on the uh, right ramrod, so that they it was, as a witness mark, so that they knew they didn't have more than one ball. Though. Right. No good. Ball, very good point. More, more if you'll notice on this rod right here, I've got it grooved with a hacksaw and marked. When I seat the bullet. When I see the load, that mark is even with the end of the barrel. If I'm out there hunting and throwing rounds around and stuff like this, and all of a sudden that mark is up above the top of the barrel, I'm not going to shoot because that's a double load. In a gun that has a very loose uh, fit, yes it will. If it's got a normal or tight fit, typically no. But you could certainly put in, you know, keep shooting. I've had that happen. Keep putting them in, keep, keep jumping it up. They also have CO2 um, uh, extractors. It's got a little fitting on there with a CO2 bottle. And you put that over the, uh, the nipple and give it a shot, and it just blows the, uh, the powder and the ball and the patch right out the end of the barrel. That's cheating, though. That's easy. Yeah. When you're seeding the, the bullet or the salmon, is there any indentations in the, in the chamber where your, where your load and everything is, or is it smooth all the way down that you're just pressing it onto your powder charge? It's rifled all the way down, and you're pressing it onto the right onto the powder charge. You pour the powder down there. The, the, back, of the, the back of the rifle is just sealed. You put the powder in there, and you just take the ball or the uh, patch or the conical or the uh, sabot, and it just gets rammed right down on top of the powder charge. Is it, is it a feeling on, on how, far, how hard to push it down, or do you, you know, how much pressure do you want to put on it here? It's, it's kind of a learning process. You give it a, I mean, you don't beat it down real hard, but you seat it firmly on the, uh, the patch. Typically, I will leave, when, when I get down, with, when this mark is typically about this far, above the end of the barrel, I do that in one full push. 
and that sinks it down firmly on the uh, on the powder. So it'll stop eventually. The powder's not compressed. That's right. It won't compress. And the the basic thing is you want consistent. You you want to see it the same the same way all the time as much as you can. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.